Hello. Hello, everybody. Oh, man. I am seeing on my computer that the video is not great. It's another internet problem day at the ranch, which is why, and that's a big reason why, I'm going to live in another woodsy place as soon as I can. Uh, a woodsy place with fiber optic cable instead of, we have, I believe we have internet here that is run by crows. Yes, they sort of fly around broadcasting things. How are you all? People are jumping in, I see. Even if the, yikes, the video quality kind of is awful. Hi from Mexico, Miguel, how are you doing? Hello from Colorado, Christine. Oh, so good to see you guys. Wisconsin from Marianne, how are you doing? Jessica and Susan and Trisha and Natalie. So good to see everybody. What y'all been doing? Arizona, New Hampshire, Leipzig, yay. Aloha from the islands. Hi, Kathleen, how are you doing? <sighs> all our folks, it's literally like we have a room and we all show up every week. It's so amazing. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Lynn. Ah, South London, yay. Where my daughter lives now, West Virginia. Alaska, hi, Trisha. You genius, you. Um, yes. And Carol, another genius from New Zealand. Yes, yes, yes. From Chicago, from Albany, from Florida, from New Jersey, from Connecticut, from Indiana. This is fun. I'm sorry if I look as bad on your screen as I do on mine. But we, yeah, we employ mice to run the internet in our neck of the woods. And uh, no, that is not true. <laughs> sorry. Actually. It usually works pretty darn well, but today it looks a little pixelated. Okay, it's good to see you all. And I think we've got enough people in the gathering room that we should start talking about things. So today we had a question from Mary Ann Lowry, who works, I think, with young men. Mary Ann, do you work with young men, or is that just a, a particular passion of yours? Because I, I think you've asked this question before. like. There are so many more women on this call than there are men. There are so many more men that are disaffected and cut off from themselves. And believe me, the men aren't missing from this kind of a room because they're feeling tremendously fulfilled and like life is everything they want. Actually, life men are trapped in what um, this one sociologist called, and says, yay, it's gathering room time. I know I have to do a short dance. Okay, dance done. So there was this sociologist, right? His name was Max Weber, and he was a German dude, and he wrote books this thick. And then he intermittently would go into periods of deep depression. And he kind of invented sociology, actually. And one of the things that he could see was that the way our society is built is it's an individual um, competition. So every individual is sort of fighting for status with every other individual, power, wealth, and status, the three things we fight for. And people who are very powerful and ruthless tend to get to the top of the a pyramid of those things, power, wealth, and status. So the more advantages you have, the higher in the pyramid you are. But the higher in the pyramid you are, the more you are cut off from other human beings because the whole system is isolating. It says you as an individual must compete against other people as individuals. And that is not how other societies are constituted. They actually think of themselves as groups. Like I talked about honeybees once here when I asked like, what would a new consciousness society look like? And I saw this beehive. And what you realize is that bees function together. One bee on its own is not considered even a life form by biologists, it, it is the hive, because bees do not function individually, they function only in groups. Well, human beings are like that too. If we're put in solitary confinement, it literally 
drives us crazy. It is such a severe punishment that we take serial murderers and we punish them with solitary confinement. These are not people who get along with other people and yet being away from other people is the ultimate punishment. Well, the irony is that our whole society is structured to, isolate, to put us in solitary confinement, to make us compete with one another until there is no sense of group unity. And the higher you get, the worse it becomes. And the more a society develops, the more it becomes bad for all the individuals in that society. So the more that, so take American society, not all of you are here from America, but it, we're in the position that Rome was in before it fell, right? It, we are wealthy, powerful, um, and culturally not very empathic with the rest of the world, I would say. Sorry to generalize, but I think that's true. And so we're at the top of the pyramid of the world, and within our society, women come lower in the pyramid. You know, we're meant to, we're supposed to take care of other people more. We talked about this last time. Men are supposed to just be sort of ruthlessly out for themselves and climbing, 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 climbing. And so that's what all men do in our culture. And they're defined by how they earn money, which is also not normal in terms of human experience over time and, and space. It's just our culture defines people by how much stuff they have and what they do for a living, which is not a thing in a traditional village. But even our names, you know, the Baker, Miller, Hunter, those are all names taken from occupations and or people take their surnames from um, the land they own. So Hill, um, what are some other names? Um, Forrester, that kind of thing. You get names that are based on people who own land and then what people did for a living. And there are many more people who do things for a living. All right. So men are locked at the top. They're at the top of the pyramid, which is where you want to be in our culture. There's so much pressure that if somebody comes down from the pyramid, it's considered this big, huge shame. So if you decide you want to um, have less money, for men, okay, so women can dress like men. I could wear a business suit that looks just like a man's suit, cut to fit me, and everybody would go, yay. Um, and Woods is saying her name, Woods, is taken from land ownership. It is. So, except maybe Anne's people were fairies who lived in the woods. I like that. So, what was I saying? The man, oh, if I wear a business suit like a man's suit, everybody would say, nice suit, Marty. But if a man were to wear a frilly dress, he could actually get arrested. He would certainly be mocked. Because in our society, if you go up the pyramid, in other words, if I'm lower down because I'm a woman, but I dress like a man, that's considered good. But if a man's here and he dresses like a woman, he gets castigated and shamed and like beaten up in the streets. So women are sort of outside. Like I talked last time about how women got caught between the individual achievement and the, the need to take care of other people and how a lot of the women that I interviewed went to a spiritual perspective that wasn't even part of society. So in a weird way, we got busted out of what Weber called the iron cage, that our whole culture is moving into this, into solitary confinement. He called it the iron cage of rationalism. And women got ripped out of it, basically, in the 90s, the noughties, and still. And so women are much more likely to go off on a spiritual path, to break with the cultural assumptions of our entire, you know, developed modern world, women can kind of get away with it. Men are considered higher ranking, and so if they try to leave, it's a huge step down. It's a massive shame. Now here is the punchline of it all. Because the way technology is developing, the jobs that men have done, the Hunter Miller Baker jobs, are pretty much gone. Like, there, there will always be Hunter Miller Baker that most of that work is being done by machinery, and now all the service industry things are being done by computers. So jobs are going away, not because they're going offshore or anything, but just because they're going away. There is no more slide rule industry. There are no more factories to make 
cassette tapes. They're gone, all right? And they're not coming back. So as they're being pushed up the pyramid, all the ways of going up the pyramid are changing and going away. And men are trapped in this space where they can't move down because the shame, the push of social pressure is so intense. So here's an example that I always give. If I have a female client who has a, a job and it's murdering her soul and she's been depressed forever, I say, go home and uh, you know quit your job and go home and talk to your husband. And she does and they work it out pretty much. I've had male clients who were so depressed that they just sat in my office and cried for an hour at a time, like without making any noise because that men don't cry, right? Because they hated their job so much. But if I told them to quit and they went home to tell the wife and she told her parents and he told his friends and everything, can you, you guys know what kind of social pressure that man would face, right? It would be almost undoable. It would be almost undoable. And anyone else who looked at his resume to try to get a job again would say, what's this gap? How could you have left? What is wrong with you? So men are measured by their jobs. They can't get out of being measured by their jobs in terms of social pressure. And the jobs are going away. Yay! What a fun situation for men. And we've seen politically and in many other ways how men are starting to panic about it. <laughs> yeah, Brian from Newkirk is saying, yes, crazy freaking social pressure. It is real. It is so real. It's like when women tried to own property and got arrested for it or wanted to vote and got arrested. It's not quite legal pressure, but it's really close and it's actually stronger. So what do we have to offer? Women who've been smashed out of the iron cage have found something out. When you get smashed by the iron cage, we try to climb the pyramid and then it's like, wait, I want to have a baby. And my parents are getting older and I like people. Why? I don't want to go into solitary confinement. So there was this weird experience that I saw people having, women having at a pretty high level, um, which is to break free from cultural definitions completely and go by an internal moral compass. And this is the origin of the gathering room and everything else because this is how this is how most of us are living. We're living by the internal compass and we navigate these weird cultural waters. And because we were lower on the pyramid, all right, you can, like one thing I learned when I became gay at 31 was gay men may get beaten up in public probably, I think a lot more than gay women. Like, Lesbians don't really threaten society because they're so far outside. Like a woman with a woman, that's powerlessness times powerlessness. Nobody's scared of that. But a man with a man, oh, that's power times power. Oh, they're going to destroy us. So women kind of got thrown away. And for that reason, we're able to wake up from the cultural dream. That's what my first novel is about, Diana herself. It's a, a brown-skinned woman of no family. She's found on a trash heap as a baby. And because of that, she's able to fully awaken. She has no investment in culture at all. She's got nothing to lose. So there are men out there who still think they've got nothing to lose, but they've got nowhere to go. And what I would like, since most of us here are women, is I'd really like to put out an intention from all of us right now for the men who are in pain in the world. And I would really like for us to imagine them finding their, cracking the cultural eggshell, getting out of, getting their minds out of the cultural structures that are crushing them to death and leaving them with no options. So everybody right now, I guess this is a kind of prayer. I just want to offer the intention that all our brothers, our sons, our friends, our fathers, our husbands, our lovers, whoever you love who's male, find comfort in a time when there are really structural pressures that are destroying people's hearts and minds. Find their way out of the iron cage. Find their way back to nature. Men's bodies, like women's bodies, are meant to be outside doing active things in the sunshine, not in fluorescent offices with other people telling them what to do. So 
Let all these men find their way out, find a new way, find their internal compasses and follow them to their own North Stars and join the sort of the collective um, search for enlightenment that has brought us, mostly women, here today. That is my prayer to whoever's up there, whatever's out there. And now I would like to take some questions. Hello, Miguel. He says, I'm a man and I totally get what you say. I'm 25 and I'm working on expanding my horizons. Sometimes it's hard because my family thinks I'm just lazy and I don't want to settle for entering the same rat race as everyone. Miguel, don't let them break you. <laughs> like, find the compass in your heart. We track our way through life by the feeling of joy in the body. And I've been down the road of being a family head of household breadwinner and thinking I had to sell my soul to an organization. And I've seen, I felt the soul murder of that. Anything is better, Miguel. <laughs> I mean, at some points, my heart led me into jobs. It led me into a job teaching business school that I loved. And it's led me to create my own business, which I love. But do not sell your heart to the cultural norms. They don't even work anymore. They won't even get you the promotions in the corner office. It, no matter what you do, you're still likely to lose out. So hang in there. We, we are around you. We surround you and we support you. And we know that there are ways through life that don't follow that iron pyramid cage. So hang in, hang in. Okay, Renee says, <clears throat> Do you think all this has something to do with the failure to launch problems we're seeing? Absolutely. The, the face of the economy is changing so rapidly that, that it used to be, okay, the generation after World War II, all these men came home to various countries. The GI Bill was there. Tremendous numbers of men had been killed all over the world. So there was this sort of a big industrial economy with not very men, not very many men there. So everyone got a job, everyone got promoted. If you went to college, you automatically got a good job coming out of college. And then you just kept going up the ladder, but that hasn't been true for like 50 years. And now we're in this bizarre fluid economy that is nothing like that. So we're going on a 1950s model, which was totally anomalous even in world history. I mean. People stayed on farms, they stayed in the tribe, they didn't go off when they were 25 to do something separate from their families and their villages, that's, that's weird. So we're all focusing on this 1950s model and thinking that's what men should be and it's insane. Yes. Yes. So Sandy says, how can we help our men take the first step? And here's how you do it. You listen to them. Like, I, and it, it's so interesting. I talk about how men used to sit in my office and cry. I, they, would, they would do that, but I couldn't get them to talk because you don't talk about feelings. You don't talk about the feeling that your life is over and you're only 25 or you're only 40 or whatever it is. So you need to have more space and more... Uh, compassion directed toward you and it's very helpful if you are asked direct questions about your life like boy I was at the gathering room and Martha Beck said that men are feeling completely trapped by cultural pressure do you feel that way like how do you feel what are your hopes for your future what what do you think will happen and then just let them let them talk and let them feel Spark it with a few questions and get them going. Mm. Teresa says, if they can't quit their jobs because of finances, then what next? Well, it's the same thing for women who can't quit their jobs because of finances. I learned something from my son's high school teacher that is so useful. She said, I've learned from teaching children with intellectual disabilities that the answer what will I do if X doesn't work is always this, something else. 
What will I do if I can't pass my GED? Something else. What will I do if I can't uh, learn to count? Something else. What will I do if, if uh, you know, I can't live at home anymore? Something else. And there's always something else. And the thing is that women have a little more leeway in terms of the something else. And men feel like they have to stay in the cage. But here's the deal. As I said, all the jobs are going away. So what if we went back to Tinker Taylor, um, Baker, Archer? What if people started going out and following their own bliss to creating new ways of making money, which is what I did, right? Like I'm an author, but that's not enough to, to pay the rent. So I found out that people like life coaching and people like being trained as life coaches. Who knew? I didn't. I never set out to do that. But it's like, oh, people need that. It could do them good. Huh. All right. I, I love to get a meditation from Eckhart Tolle for $10. If a million people did that, not a million people do that for me, by the way, but if, if, if a thousand people bought a 10-minute meditation that really makes their life better, that's ten thousand dollars for me, and everybody's life is better. And every so you can think in very basic terms, almost like you're making your way through a forest and learning what foods you can eat and what tools you can use. You get creative, and it leads to a micro entrepreneurialism in most cases that I've seen, where people really break through. But here's what you get when you break out of the cage: you get your creativity back. And here's what happens when you start to create things. You align yourself with the energy of creation itself, and something starts to flow through you, and it directs you, and it helps you. Doesn't mean you don't have to work hard, but it's like surfing. You you balance in your own bliss, and then the 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 water itself throws you forward. And that doesn't mean you don't fall down, and it doesn't mean it's not good exercise, but it does mean you make your own way. And there's always something else. There is always something else. Carol says, do you know any men who've broken free? I feel, I feel we all need better role models to point to. It seems men have to choose between traditional masculinity and the sensitive new age, I'm a feminist too model and it's so restrictive. You're right. Like who would want that? Um, I will give you one role model, one of my dear, dear friends. His name is David Varty and when he and his brother were in their teens, his father died and left them with this bankrupt cattle farm in Africa. And all their advisors said, sell that piece of useless land and, you know, support your mother. Get good jobs. You're bright boys. Go get good jobs. And they said, but we love the we love the wilderness and we are going to basically make up luxury safaris and we're going to take people out and track animals. So I'm going to Africa next month to do seminars out there in this amazing place, Londolozi, that, that Dave and his brother John created. Now, I know that's extreme, but there are a lot of people who can do similar things. My, a master coach in my system his name is, is Michael Trotta. He was an elementary school teacher, but he's also an artist, a coach, a, a, a tracker. He's a fire master who, was, who studied with Indian wise men. And the, I remember just having fights with him. Like I, He's like, I can't leave the system. I have to support my family. And I kept saying to him, no, if you go, if you follow your passion, it will, the money will follow. And then there came a time when he sat with me and he said, I get what you're saying. And he said something I'll never forget. He said, I never imagined I could make so much money. But imagine how much money I could make if I could imagine making more. <laughs> so what he identified there was that <clears throat> we get trapped in the cage because of failure of imagination. There's a, a guy named Rob Bell, a preacher, a cool preacher, who says, a minister, not a preacher. And he says, failure of imagination all the time he said, it has people come to, and tell him, well, I want to do something different, but I can't imagine living outside of Michigan. And he's like, you can't imagine living outside of Michigan? You have an imagination? God is the force that imagines, and you can't imagine living anywhere but Michigan. 
Start imagining something more. Start imagining. That's the only reason we have what's here is that we imagine it. Imagine something different for yourself, for your men folk, for the world. Yay. Oh, oh, we're trying to get, oh, Brian says, we don't cry, we don't talk, we barely grieve. The stereotype of stoic manliness, especially the older you are. I also think it's a mix of both jobs going away and men actually going through a spiritual awakening. Oh, Brian, I so hope you're right. That has been my case, where there's such a physical and spiritual conflict in the rat race I'm in now. Oh, God bless you, Brian Newkirk. This is so true. I remember in, in my very first book, there's not a lot I'm proud of in that book, but I remember saying um, in it, um, therapists' offices are full of women who need to rage and can only grieve, and prisons are full of men who need to grieve and can only rage, because the system doesn't give women permission to get angry, and it doesn't give men permission to have any softness at all. So. I am so glad, Brian, <laughs> that you found yourself in a crucible that broke you open. <clears throat> because I truly do think that the way out of this is spiritual awakening. <clears throat> Sorry, why do I think that? Because, spirit, and this is what I found doing my dissertation so long ago. Spiritual awakening is a non-social phenomenon. It is outside of culture. I started by saying we are, the, we are absolutely social beings. That is true. In, all but one sense. And that sense is that we have this capacity to spiritually awaken. And it breaks us out of the cultural norm and all new cultures have been formed by people who had a spiritual awakening and then people followed that. So spiritual awakening is the way. And Brian, you are like headed out as a scout ahead of almost all other men. And we are so, so lucky to have you here and all the other guys on this call. We love you. So, should we do one more question? Okay, Betsy Pearson. Hi, Betsy. Martha, do you think it helps or hurts a young man, son, to support him financially as he is searching? Do you think there's a limit to this? And thanks so much. Um, I have a young man who's 30 who's in the other room singing his lungs out because that's how he spends his days because he has an extra chromosome. So he gets to be off the cultural bus. He doesn't even get to be on the pyramid. And everyone said when he was born, what a tragedy. And it's not. He's a Zen master, right? He's spiritually awake. Um, he's the calmest, uh, most insightful, most genuinely clear person I've ever met. And I don't think it's because of Down syndrome because he has friends with Down syndrome who are different from that. But I think because I knew what he was from the beginning and I had the choice to just chuck him off the pile because he wouldn't fit into the pyramid. And I said, wait, instead of getting him out of my life, why don't I get the pyramid out of my life and out of his life? And I remember watching like sports competitions and, and uh, you know, rat race TV and stuff on movies about men and thinking, thank God he's not part of that. And since then, I've seen brilliant young men who are so hurting. And I would, if, if I had a nickel to my name, I would finance the spiritual awakening of those young men. I, I mean, I've got a nickel left, I mean. I would spend it to support people like that because that's what we're here for. We don't, there is no happiness in being at the top of that pyramid. The happiness is in waking up together. And I'm not saying that you should all support your sons forever and ever, but I am saying that you have a compass inside of you that is linked to everyone, especially those you love. And some of those people I sure hope are men and that compass in your heart will tell you how to help everyone, including yourself. And sometimes, yes, that will mean, I think, supporting a son when our culture says, what is he doing? He should be off in a job that no longer exists, um, doing things to make himself um, further into the iron cage. Fine. If he, if he gets all the way, he'll be in solitary confinement forever. Nah, 
I believe that the money doesn't come from jobs. The money comes from whatever God is, and it can come to your men through any kind of tributary, through any kind of capillary. It can come through all sorts of rivers and streams. Betsy Pearson is a water hydraulics expert. So it can come through anything. And if you're the one through whom the money is supposed to flow, you will feel it. And if uh, <clears throat> you're supposed to stop it and say, go get your own money, you will feel that too. And it will be the best thing for everybody. So that's how I'll end is with the, with the slogan that came to me when I was having my B vision, which is all for all, always. Not all for one and one for all, but all for all, always, because that's how the God force works. We are not individuals alone. We are connected. And those of us who have made it out of the cage are, are going to keep sending the love and sending the spirit that's going to crack out all those men we adore. Mwah! I love you guys. I will see you next week. Have a great one.